thank you everyone for coming. As you probably know, we have now in the gallery exhibition Fighting on All Fronts Women at War, dedicated to the role of uh, women in the Second World War in different countries. And today, as a part of our exhibition, we have a talk by David Hill, who will give us uh, some secret information about women's spies. Very much. It's about secret information, but I'll do my best. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I'm going to try and start with, with, with three areas. First of all, first of all, with a quick uh, introduction. Then uh, tell you about a bit myself. Hopefully, some house rules, and then, and then finish off with some questions and where the toilets are and stuff like that. So, but before we do that, I think it's actually fitting. Well, we'll get a glasses filled just to add a little bit of a cheers to these brave women that were truly brave. And I was speaking to the uh, owner the, uh, earlier on about stuff about this and the stories about particularly women agents because they were truly exploited. My wife thinks they were exploited. I know some women say they were doing their job. But when I say exploited, I mean it. They went from prostitution to assassination to running to looking after agents. And they become nurses and then become mums. And when they finished this, they were just back to work. So some people call it exploration, exploitation. Some people say they're doing their jobs. But so if I just ask you to raise a glass, if you've got it or not filled, I just say female agents. Cheers. <laughs> so, quick introduction. Who am I? What do I do? My name's David Hill. I do this as a hobby, it's my little uh, thing I do on the side. My daily regular job, I'm a senior fire officer. I go and put fires out every day. I've been doing it for 30 years. Before that, I was a soldier, and I'm still currently a reservist soldier. And that's what I do. I'll talk about that later on in a second. Um, a few thank yous, I guess, is right. Thank you for the uh, gallery for offering me to come and do this. It's really nice you to do it. And I'm truly a virgin at this, so please bear with me. Okay? No hackling or throwing things at me. <laughs> if you do, make sure it's soft. Um, a few house rules. If I can just ask you to just be a bit polite and put your phone around there, because nothing more important than take a phone call. I uh, understand this toilet's downstairs for everyone if they need it. And if you need to get yourself a drink, or if there's a dying question you ask, because you might forget it, just stick your hand up or show me your face and hopefully I'll get out straight away. And the way I try and do this uh, sort of slideshow really is more about interaction instead of just listening to me being at school going, this is what you've got to do, this is it. So I'm going to try and grab what you know, what you don't know, and go into it. Otherwise it just becomes a little story and show really. Uh, this is very new, this one. I've never done the female wage and stuff again because the subject is so wide. And it, believe it or not, it's still secret some of it. I was really privileged to a good friend of mine, he's GCHQ's archivist, who helped me put this together. And I literally rang him down and said, give me the figures, everyone wants to know the figures. And he went, I can, Dave, but they change every week, because every time we, every week comes, they extend the secret law. Does everyone understand what the secret law is? So it's called the Official Secrets Act. And, and, and effectively, if something's a secret, as in HMQ, Majesty the Queen, Majesty the King, is a secret, it's a crown secret. Okay? And that can be written, drawn, Kept anything, anything to be a secret. And this is where the bit I get slightly upset about when, when people talk about loyalty. Yeah, if it's a secret, it's a secret. Yeah? If it's a written secret, it's generally kept for a minimum of 80 years. But they can extend that. And there's a whole host of reasons why you keep these secrets. Not because the government would hide what they did and what they didn't do. It could be relationship stuff. It could be your best neighbour. He didn't know that you was doing stuff they shouldn't be. It could be a relationship you've had with your partner all these years, and little did you know he was having a secret relationship in Berlin. So it's very, it's very, very awkward. The whole world of SOE agents is a murky and grey and horrible world. Take it from me, you do not want to be a part of it. But, in the words of a lot of ministers, without that murky, horrible world, we want to know what's coming over the horizon. And that's, how, that's, that's the reality of it. I can sit there all day and we can all sit there and go, oh, party this, party that, and you're not allowed to do this, and he did that. The reality is, if you don't gather information on something you need to know, you ain't doing it. you're never going to get anywhere. Any battle, without intelligence first, you can't attack. If you take the war particularly, without the intelligence for D-Day, we was never going to go. And interesting enough, there's a famous film just started. Do you know what film is out of the moment? Operation Mincemeat. That was the deception plan. All around these people, the deception plan, that was it. The myth, the deception that we, the Allied troops, was going to go to Sicily and invade 
from the southern part of France into the north. The best deception plane I would say there ever was. Where did we come in from? We come from Normandy, the north. It was almost the complete opposite. And this was all arranged, built, and thought about was all of the SOE. Okay, so the best deception plan ever did. Really good. And it's apparently it's going to be um, an award winning film, so I suggest you watch it. And all the stuff I talk about today, there's always bits and pieces of films. And it's really interesting that I was speaking to the, the owner of the gallery around us all today. This, this is all, this is all deception, this is all propaganda, isn't it? Everything you read. Look at the pictures. Lovely looking women, lovely looking men, muscly men, sailors in their uniform. It's all draw you in to come and see what they're going to do. Okay? In the war, in these sort of times we're talking about, it was to bring your pots and pans, we need your metal. Don't tell the secrets. It's all propaganda, it's all, it's all, it's all deception. Okay? I think today, now what we live in today, is somewhat different. Because we have Google, don't we? we actually find out, we ask the questions. We ask the question for the Prime Minister. You tell me what you did. You tell me how you did it, why you did it. So it's somewhat different. Oh, stand easy, it's all right. 55 press ups, stand easy. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm sure the owner of going, get yourself a drink of water or a glass of bubbly. Thanks. Um, so, so it's all that sort of grey de 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 deception stuff you've got to think about. And you've got to try and cast your mind back as I speak. Because you're thinking, well, just pick the phone up and tell your mate. Well, you've got, you've got to just pick the phone up. There wasn't such a thing as a mobile phone. There wasn't pay phones. There was one phone in a hotel if you was lucky. And a telephone always went to a, 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 a telephone exchange. And the telephone exchange was intercepted. There wasn't laptops. There wasn't, you know, uh, bits of paper. There was pigeons. You got messages by a pigeon. No? The internet of them days was a pigeon. It was a pigeon in a box with a message on its ankle. That's how the coded message got back. You have satellite. You know, and all this just you know you see on the telly now with Ukraine, you know, all the Russian tanks queued up. They, they're washing you at sixty thousand miles in the sky. Well, there wasn't such thing. The way you see things are ground in was the agents on the floor, and that's how we did it. Okay, everyone happy with that? Right then. So can we uh, go on to the next uh, slide, please? And the way we're going to do the time uh, of the evening, if I can, I'll sort of do fifteen minutes of introduction. How we're going to go? We do half hour into the big meat of it, a little run down, and then any questions come up, please ask. So, I was going to explain to you about uh, me. So the London Clandestine Warfare Collection is what I do. It's my collection. I've collected it over the last 15 to 20 years. And it is all the gadgets. It's all the gadgets we have that the agents would use. And it's all original from World War II. It's in about two or three hotels in the centre of London. The centre of London was the hub of recruiting and where agents did their business. Okay? And, and it was like, you ain't got to be the, you know, the brains of Einstein to work it is. It was Pall Mall. It was St James's. It was Regent Street. It was Regent's Park. Because influence and money are always joined together. And what's not far from St James's and Pall Mall? The powerhouse of the country, the houses of parliament. Okay? And, and my collection, and that's what you're going to see later on, hopefully, some pictures of it, is, um, is a, a, a large collection. And it's currently in St Ermin's Hotel. And St Ermin's Hotel, if you get time to go to St Ermin's Hotel, this is where Winston Churchill had the thought of starting Special Operation Executive over a cigar and a whiskey in the foyer, and it's still there today, and it's the same. As soon as he said, we're going to set Europe ablaze, that's where he formed it. He said, right, from now, top floor, closed down. I want that to be headquarters of SRV. And I was there for about 10 months. So that was the way the formation was. That's where he was. Across the street from there, you don't know the area, across the street from there, that's where SIS was, which we now know is Secret Service Service, is known as MI6. Does everyone understand what the MI stands for? Am I? Military intelligence. It's military intelligence, yeah. Everyone thinks it's something secret. It's not, it's military intelligence. The reason why it's called military intelligence, the Navy in 1890 realised that to find out what the ports were doing around the world, because they knew World War I was coming. And the only people who could do that were naval officers, and they become military intelligence officers. And over the years, it just went from then on, really, when it had to stay here. And it's today, MI5 and MI6, the class as military intelligence. MI5 and MI6 is fundamentally run by civilians, though, not by military. Okay? So why am I so interested in it all? As I said to myself, I am a Royal Marine Commando. I joined the Marines in October 1983, and I spent pretty much the first part of my life 
after jumping the uh, fence at school, joined the service as a, a Royal Marine Commando and eventually joined a small branch called the Mountain Leaders Branch. And our fundamental job was to work behind the lines. And like many other people in my category, I've been to pretty much most of the war campaigns. So I've been to Iraq, I've been to Bosnia. So I understand some of the military specifications of what's going on. Now, what I'm going to talk about SOE is something different. These are full on inbred agents in, in, inside the countries. Okay? And we're going to concentrate very much on the women's side. As I said to you, women generally got very, very truly exploited. Now, lots of figures about this. They reckon there was 13,000 people involved in the whole of the SOE group. And the SOE group was large. It wasn't just a small group of people smoking, talking through uh, tissues and you know, walking in, in, in the dark with your true be out on. It, it was bigger than that. You had to get logistics part of it. You had to get a drop-off. You had to get people there by sea. So it was all three services. So it was Air Force, Army and Navy. And of course the extra bit with this was the civilian agents coming in. Yeah, most of these Army, Air Force and Navy individuals generally couldn't speak a foreign language and they would have been called up to war. However, a lot of the civilian side of it, they were generally women, very well-to-do men, very well-educated ladies that would generally be able to speak a various language and that's why they would get called in. So if you could speak three different uh, languages, you couldn't teach an average commander to talk those languages, you really had the person ready to do it for you. What you then did, you converted that language into being a commander, which was a lot easier to do. And a part of all this as well was a part of what they called MI9, and their job was to retrieve Allied pilots back through what was known as the rat runs from concentration camps, because what they realised during the war, all our pilots were going behind and shot down, we needed to get back in Blighty to carry on the war. So you can teach a pilot really easy, but you can't do it quickly. So it's easier to get the people out of concentration camps back home than teaching. So it's a very, very complex structure. SOE, yeah, and MI9, and Q, and F section, and I'll try and go through it in slow time. When I talk about a section, F, I, A, is generally pre noun by the country. So F section, clearly was France. P section was Poland. A, G, actually was Africa, believe it or not. And SOE went across the whole piece. They didn't just do Europe, Poland, Russia. They went right away across the Pacific. And, and, and people forget, it started in 40 and it finished in 46, not 45. Because the war in Europe finished in 45, but it carried on going in the Pacific in 46. So it was almost another year before it finished. So we still had agents in the Pacific as well. Okay. But what was their job? Next slide, please. What was their job and what did they do? Well, it was a brainchild. This man, we all know he is, Winston Churchill. There he is up on this poster, actually. It was his brainchild. He had to find a way how he was going to do it. His original idea was to, what he said in his fantastic speech was we need to occupy France and burn Europe inside out. How was he going to do that? And how did he get up with that idea? Where did it come from? Winston Churchill was an interesting man. He actually was originally a liberal. He wasn't a Tory, I think he was a staunch Tory. He wasn't, he was a liberal. And he was from very good stock. There's no two ways about that. And his politi political world was all over the place. In fact, before he actually got this job, he was almost bankrupt. And I'm pleased to say, I could say this because Nicholas Soames, his grandson, is my patron of my collection as well. So it's, it's very good. Um, he was absolutely a brain of marvel. He had this idea, and all his ideas, even from Commando, came from him. Commando is a South African word for a small group of men to uh, infiltrate and attack. And they spit of a K, and that's why some sort of C commander spit of a K. So we spit of a C. That was originally his ease idea. Because he was in the Boer War. Then he was in the First World War. And there he is being a Prime Minister of the Second War. So in terms of credibility, he had a huge credibility. And this is what he had to do. He just knew about guerrilla warfare, how it worked in South Africa, how it worked in, in the First World War, and it got to work in the, in, in, in the Second World War. Don't forget, the Germans literally invaded Europe. They literally invaded Europe. You know, they took, it, it took them weeks, weeks and weeks, just to get from Berlin to Paris. They was there, done. It was over. They were that far. They was that strong. They were that build up. And Hitler himself was, again, was a very bright man. He knew what was coming. He knew he had to get all the logistics. He knew he had to get the pilots. He had to get the planes, he had the ammunition, the propaganda, information, intelligence all in. So the brainchild of SOE, Special Operations Group, 
was this man, Winston Churchill. I'm not going to read off the slides, you can read yourself, and I'm just going to pick bits out of the slides as we go along. As it says there, set Europe ablaze. In order to call that in action by subversion and sabotage. Subversion and sabotage. There's lots more. There's other words. Deception. Lies. Deceit. You know, all this really long, posh words. But they all basically mean the same thing. To kill, to disrupt, to assassinate the enemy, to achieve your aims and goals, to win the battle. Or the political battle, or the propaganda battle, or whatever you need to win. Okay? Sabotage. Subversion. Does everyone understand subversion? So this is a real murky grey word, isn't it? Subversion. You tell me to tell you to tell them to tell them to do that. You do that before you know you're lost in motion. I've seen you with someone who's having an affair, but it wasn't really an affair. Oh yes, it was. Oh yeah, you tell me. All this some horrible murky stuff. It is a murky word, and that gets back to women again, because they were truly, I don't want to use the words, exploited. Some people say they're doing their job, but they really was, because they had a long and wide, wide need, literally. Um, but that's the man who formed it, Winston Churchill. Um, and if you come to the hotel, please come to the hotel. His chair is still there, and you can ring the House of Commons bell and wake him up if you want. You can actually ring it; it's still ringing the House of Commons. Come and see the collection, you're more than welcome. Uh, next slide, please. There you go. Bucky, like used to call him. This was a man in F section, French, I'll see. He come later in about 41. But don't forget, there was a great big battle in the political battle. No difference we have today. Can you imagine in 1940s? The Labour Party had just gone over. Winston Churchill just won. He was overweight. He was not very healthy. No one particularly liked him. His career was going down. His father was in a, it was a disaster for him. There he is, he's got the whole of the ministry, it was called the War, Cap, War Cabinet by then, he had to sort this out. Everyone was juggling around for money to ensure that we had to win this battle because they realised it was pretty much up. And you've seen all the other history about it. You know, was we going to win? Was we going to collaborate with the Germans? What we're going to do? What we're not going to do? All this other stuff. But one thing they realised is they had to make sure Great Britain, as it was, was going to win this war. And the biggest strength they had, they had the Commonwealth. Now, England was very small. 10 million people in London, there wasn't that in the country in the 40s. Yeah, but what they had is the Commonwealth, they could call them resources. And all good wars, you need resources. You need all sorts of resources. You need people, you need kit, you need equipment, you need ammunition, you, you need food, all this stuff. It, it, any good soldier on the front line will have 15 people behind him supporting that, that, that attack, effectively. So there he was, Bucky. Uh, apparently, he was a su 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 super um, educated man. He uh, later moved from uh, St. Ermin's Hotel and set their up headquarters in Baker Street. And that was actually called Baker, Bo ba Baker Boys Regulars, that's what it was called. And the ministry actually called them the War of Ungentlemanly Conduct. It was ungentlemanly Conduct. You would go behind the lines and lie and burn the money. And, you know, there was one operation that you went to France and, and they took something like 54 million euros or whatever it was in them days to upset the economy that's how you do it you upset the economy there's other ways to win a war than killing the germans with a tommy gun upset the infrastructure and, and in fact interesting enough you can see that on the tv today can't you sort of russian to Ukraine. upset the infrastructure infrastructure is very 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 important you have to have water you have to have line you have to have the communications you need money to do this stuff it upset the infrastructure and that was his idea he had this idea of you had to upset the infrastructure, you had to get people in, behind the lines, set a resistance group up to fight this battle inside out. Now France, at that stage, was a huge country and it was generally split in half. By 1941, the, the French Prime Minister was back in Blighty, he come over here. His headquarters wasn't very far from Pall Mall, believe it or not. Okay, it was literally just down the road from, from the palace. In fact, it was five doors away from the German embassy. That's exactly where it was. You may have seen some pictures during World War II. It's the only time you ever see pictures of England having swastikas, because the, the British, the German embassy, uh, ambassador at the time was completely against Hitler. But he died. So Hitler said, I'll tell you what, we're going to have a German funeral, march him up and down now in the Pound Mall, in a full consage of all the uh, swastikas. And that's why sometimes you see these pictures of a swastika on the mall. And that's what it was. It was his funeral, actually. And he got on the train, and away he went. This man, Bucky, 
There's lots of stuff written about SOE, lots of stuff written about this stuff, and they've been writing about the SOE for 80 years, and I think you spoke to me earlier on to say you wrote, you, you read some books about it. And it's, it's, it's a subject so wide, I'll be here for a month or so and explain it, but I'm just gonna try and pick out a few interesting stories on what went on and what we didn't go on. But Bucky uh, was the actual uh, main man himself who actually looks after F section and had to run out of headquarters in, uh, in, in Baker Street. All of these people, by the way, were commando trained. And this is interesting, I'm gonna talk about the commando train later on. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Now, Cummins, he come a bit later. His boss was Hugh Dalton, actually, who actually said, you are gonna uh, really, re really run this Cummins. And Dalton and Cummins had a bit of a log read because Dalton was actually a civilian and they realised that you had to be a military man to run this operation. You had to understand, and you do. You have to understand how people communicate. So if you go in Whitehall today, military will talk one language, civilians will talk another language, civil service will talk another language, you're all saying the same stuff, but you're saying a different content. This guy come in, Cummings, um, he was a brigadier at the time, he was, and he's, this whole thing about irregular warfare, this is where it come into, guerrilla warfare, and, it, and, and he's, and he's his background was basically the IRA upbringing, that's what he was. And he could see what was happening in Ireland. And he, saw, he thought, they're not doing a bad job out there. This is what we've got to do. We've got to get these guerrilla warfighters on our side. We've got to get them in country. We've got to get our own people out to do it. And that's where this all come from. You know, the resistance. The resistance was huge in France. People wanted to pick up arms and attack the Germans. Interestingly, that when the Americans wanted to come into the war, Winston Churchill said, yes, we'd love to have you, of course we want, we're desperate, we've got no money, what can you give me? And the, uh, Roosevelt said, well, what would you like? And the first thing he said, he says, I want one million liberating pistols. It's a pistol. I want one million. Give me one million, five shots in a pistol, drop them into France, behind the lines, just drop them, as parachute them in, throw them all over, and I'll, through the network, say to everyone, pick up arms, and shoot five Jerry's. One million pistols, five million shots, that's five million, that's gone, it's done, it's overnight, isn't it? It's an easy job. I don't know what Interesting, Americans did it. They produced, I think it was just about a million pistols. They didn't drop them, actually, they only dropped a few. Um, and again, uh, they are still around today. But that was the idea of it. That was the idea, that's the concept. Working behind the lines, gathering information, sabotage and upset the infrastructure, and, and, there are other words, assassinating. We was assassinating Germans. Women was assassinating. That picture you see earlier on, was that, did you see the brush in the picture earlier on, the bottom, bottom right hand corner? That's a dagger inside that. So you was coerced, you know, some lovely general after a few glasses of red wine and nice dance and your nice silk jacket and stockings come up here. General, got something to show you, a little surprise. Oh yes, my lucky night tonight. You go outside, let me do my air, General. You do your air, come back and stag him in the neck, and that's another one gone. You jump out the back door and away you go. That's the reality. That's the murky world you're in. That's the murky world. So you're going to go from coercing a General into the bedroom, stabbing him with your airbrush, jumping out the window, or ultimately getting captured and being executed, which happened a lot. It was about 40, I can check my phone because he told me every other half hour, about 40 to 50 female agents uh, got parachuted into, into, uh, into France. They didn't just parachute, by the way. They got taken by submarine. They got taken in by the embassies. They got taken in by boats, all different ways. It's not as, not as easy sometimes you think to get in and out of the country, especially when you've got the whole of the German you know, on all the borders. Don't forget France, Spain are all attached. It's a bit different in England or in Ireland. You've got to look at strategically now what it's like. But most people parachute in now. This is the murky world they lived in. And this is the man who was driving it. And his background was looking at the battles effectively of Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. Next one, please. Vera Atkins. There's a film about this lady. She's a superwoman. And when I say a superwoman, superwoman. There are rumours. Her and Ian Fleming had a little fling. That's the rumours. In the Duke's Hotel. I don't know the Duke's Hotel. Very posh hotel. Just off a of power mail, of course. She liked to drink. She used to meet her in there. 
because obviously Ian Fleming was a naval intelligence officer. Of course, that means St James's, that's where MI5 was. Next to MI5 was the Duke's Hotel, funny old thing. It's always intelligence place next to hotels and pubs, it's great, isn't it? And her job was to uh, basically recruit female agents. Okay? The military ones were easy, because all men, we just knew what they was. Female ones were difficult, because there was no women in the army. No women in the navy, no women in the RF. It wasn't like that. You can be a type right out of take Spitfires around and all this sort of stuff, but you wasn't allowed to be on the front line. This whole 1940s, oh, I dare you, it's a man's job. Her job was to find, not to be a man's job, to put a hat on you, be a commando, parachute behind the lines. That was her job. She was a very uh, sort of persuasive lady, I was informed, um, and uh, that was her job. She was, she was known as a recruiter. She done two jobs in France, actually. She actually she got some credibility, she done two jobs in France. But her main job was to uh, get female agents across the line through training. She was great, she used to do some interesting stuff. And some of the films you've seen it, she would start talking to you in fluent French. And then when your guard was down, you did it with English, you said, you're dead, you're dead. It's not gonna happen, you have to never ever drop your guard. Because you're in your France, or in Poland, or Spain, you drop your guard, it's over. It's over. It really is truly over, there's no, uh, I'm going to ring me mum. It, it, there's none. It's over. You're on your own in the middle of Paris, in the middle of Cannes, in the middle of Normandy, on the borders of Poland, on the borders of Pyrenees, on your own. And your job, it says there, yeah, you had to bring in um, uh, reception in France to prepare female agents for their missions. Most of their missions were going to be resistance, build up the resistance. How do you parachute into a village? So if I said to you now, I want you to lift up now, if I had the power to lift you up now and drop you in the middle of Norfolk Town Village. I said, when you get in there, I want you to go around and get them up together, try and become their friends, give them loads of guns, get them to shoot the right way, find out how we're going to get out and get out, and att attack everyone. Here we go. Where'd you start? Where do I live? Where's the toilets? Where's the water? What do I have? What guns will go? What's my uniform look like? It's a mission. It is literally almost a mission impossible. And that's what she did. Um, if I remember rightly, I think she got brutally murdered actually after the war. She was stalked, not by any other reason. Just she, she got, I think she got ripped up by, by literally just a coincidence. She came out of a block of flats. I'm, I'm sure it's her. I'm saying this because there are so many of them. You know, there's, there's 50 female agents, but there's, you know, there's probably. No, and another 5,000 other agents because they went a long way so please excuse me some more figures but that, that they are but that was her job her job was to recruit um, female agents and put them through the mix quite rudely and again there's a, there's a famous film about her and her biggest, one of her biggest soldiers was they wouldn't give her a uniform she wasn't allowed to have a uniform she was, she was a civil servant kind of uniform and uh, she, she won the battle. I think she got to George Cross, you know, I'll have to check that as well. Right, next, next one, please. There you go. This is where everyone, again, don't really understand. This is France, yeah? So don't forget Spain. It was neutral. Yeah, the rest of the country was pretty much invaded. France was pretty split in half. It was the occupied north and the free zone at the bottom. We say free zone. I, I, I don't know if free zone that really was, but... Um, that's where a lot of people try to get to, but definitely we know the north part, which is all of the defence area, you know, which is the our area where, they, where, where if France were going to get invaded, because don't forget we were still a big threat to Germany. So you'll see this, this, you see this term quite a lot, Vicky France, you'll see badges, free, free Vicky France, and they've got the, uh, it's like a cross with another cross on the top of it. And that's how they did it. They mainly dropped people in a free zone and then they made their way to the uh, occupied zone. Obviously Paris is in the occupied zone. Yeah. And some of their jobs are, don't forget, to set up these resistance lines and they're what are known as rap lines as well. So if you've got caught behind the lines, so don't forget, we now got British troops in concentration camps already. This is post Dunkirk, by the way. So we are now you know, thousands of troops in prison camps that we need to get back down quickly. 
And don't forget that the Britain was starting, air raids were starting, we were losing Allied troops daily, particularly aircraft pilots. We need to get them back. So if you was flying over to bomb Berlin on your way back, your engine broke, you went down into Occupy France or Free Zone, there you are, a pilot in the middle of a field gap, how do you get back to Blighty? Where, where do you start? And this is a part of the resistance groups as well. And there's hundreds of stories in front. If you get to France, there's always a story about an allied, about an allied pilot. Okay, next slide, please. So, really interested about recruiting. And this, this, this is, we, we, we're talking about female recruiting now. Recruit from all classes. And it really was, yeah. Most of the women that were uh, recruited wasn't from a lower class or from a, a effectively a working class. They were generally well-educated, particularly European. Husbands were generally majors, captains, or business owners. Hence the reason they could speak many languages. And they were educated. They were in the 40s. My mum grew up in the 40s. My nan grew up in the 40s. They were, you know, dockers' wives. They worked in tin factories. They were, you know, worked for Leslie's and done homework stuff. They stayed home with their children and worked in a cafe. The agents I'm talking about were fluent in five or six different languages. And their biggest um, asset had, they were really bright. Men generally couldn't work out the code system. So people talk about, you know, Morse code. I've done Morse code. I've cried in my back barracks, crying my eyes out. I can't do that Morse code. Dick, 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 dot, dot, dot. I don't know why. Why well, women's brains are a little bit um, wired in a different way. You could pick it up really quick, and that was what their main job was. The downside of that is. What do you think the downside of that is? Their life expectancy was six weeks. So remember what I said to you earlier on. Exploitation, well done, you're really, really clever, you can speak with some language, you're really, really bright, by the way, you only last six weeks. Welcome to SOE. That's the murky world he was in. Well done, Mrs. Smith, thank you for doing it. You speak French, German, come to France, you're really, really bright, you only last six weeks, thank you, next. That's the world we're in, that's, that's, that's it. Deception, sabotage, grey, murky area, that was it. Got a nice uniform, and when you're finished, I must say, some of the women, uh, Prince Charles was a big uh, fan of this sort of stuff. We really pushed, uh, they got some big medals post-war. It took some time, but they did. They got some big medals, i.e. big award, jewel medals and stuff like that. It says about criminal underworld and stuff like that, and this is, this is another classic film that's saying, you know, a good SOE block, a good SOE agent section, a good commando section, would have all these different people. They're bright. Have rough necks, you'd have you know, people would hesitate to kill you, hesitate to cut your throat in a, in a second. We we'll also know how to burgle if you need to get into it. If you need to find out where the general left these secret documents before there was going to be an air raid Tuesday, or how you built you know, the Norman Wall, we needed those pictures. We needed those pictures to go back to Blighty. We realised they were building huge defences on the north part of France. Well, there's no satellite. You had to find out how big the walls was, what the concrete like, what was they thick, what was the depth of them, who was doing it, where the concentration camps, where the ammunition was being stored. That was all written. And of course, that was in offices. So you had to be a good burglar. Where would you get burglars? For the criminal world. You can't teach some posh, you know, banker who just left and wants to be a, want, wants to be a commando to burgle someone's house. That's not in his DNA. So you go to the criminal world and find him. And there was lots. And of course their reward was, I'm going to make me a better man when I finish out of here. Because I will have a uniform and I'll have a medal and a pension. So it's a two-way story. So it's a, as I said to you earlier on, it's a murky world, this stuff. Now, how do you go to the prison service and say, he's a burglar, he didn't want to go to war, he killed his brother three weeks ago, and he's just been robbing a load of stuff in the, in the docks. And no, no one's got any, yeah, he'll do, he'll do, he'll do, he'll do, right, you're on commando course. Yeah? And talking of commando course, yeah. everyone had to do the commando course. It was different ranges, but it still was the commando course. They had to do commando training. That was a basic one to get that. And, and, it, and it was all different ranks as well. They had a rank structure, of course they had a rank structure. That's how you got paid. But it was, it was a real mixed match of people. And it worked. It really worked. They did, they did disband it, it worked too good, really. But, um, 
what come out of SOE is what we know today, MI5, MI6, all that other stuff. The back end of SOE, as well, was another organisation called OSS, you may have crossed that, it's a female agent to pick up in a, in a second, which is effective the CIA today. Operation Strategic Studies or Service, which is effectively this, uh, CISA. They concentrate a lot in the Pacific actually, but they also worked in France. There was a big push on D Day. There was a, a small group called Jedberg, troops that jumped in. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, before I go on to the training, any questions? Everyone happy? Are we going the right way? People want to know anything else? Look like you've got a question. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> we're, going, we're going the right direction. Yes. Well, I'm a virgin. You've got to give me a break here. <laughs> nothing, well. nothing throwing my way in it because, okay, make sure it's soft, whatever it is. So, look at all these words the War Office. The War Office, the War Cabinet. Yeah, what they did, they, they took all these large manor houses, country houses, took them up. Yeah, and said, right, these are now Crown property, we want them. And they were adopted all around the UK. It's the best one we know at the moment is in Western Scotland, is where a lot of them held off before we, but before not we, before the country fell out. Unfortunately, some of these now are just derelict. It's really a shame. And, and my friend I said, spoke to you earlier on is trying really desperately hard to raise funds to, to keep them going. But they're expensive. These are old you know, boffies and old-fashioned. You've seen them. You've seen them on the TV all the time, didn't you? They took them up. They were manor houses. Um, everyone went under commando training. Uh, obviously, in Scotland, it's horrible. It's wet. It's cold. It's windy. You're not going to send someone to the Bahamas to train you, are you? No. Unarmed combat. William Fairburn Sykes. Yeah. Interesting fellow. He was a police chief in Shanghai Police because they had the upbringing in Shanghai. Yeah. So he designed a special knife called the Commando Dagger. All commandos got missioned. It's called the Fairburn, Fairburn Sykes Commando Dagger. Very collectible. I have two. <laughs> Very collectible. And women were taught to use it. And plunge, it's a dagger. It's a killing tool. It's not to bite your bread. It's not to cut your loaf. It's a killing tool. It does one job. Inserts and kills. Don't sharpen your pencil. That's its job. Okay. And they were taught it. Unarmed combat. So when people say, we really can't do the commando course. Well, I think they did in 1940 actually, with freezing cold. And then got this kit we got on today. It was odd nail boots, putties, and itchy shirts, wool shirts. That's what they had. Okay. So these women and men, but as I said, we're talking about women, will be just taken off the streets of Pall Mall after wearing your stockings, suspenders, and all those lovely, lovely hats you would wear. There you go, on the train, do your commando course. Here's a dagger, you say you plunge and kill someone, and by the way, uh, go and sit in that house for about three days, we'll come and get you if you're lucky. And why are we doing it, we're going to interrogate you. Because if you go to France, that's what's going to happen to you. So it's a big, you know, it's a big ask for all, really. We don't mention interrogation because it's a secret, but they did go through forms of interrogation. Yeah. Interrogation in them days was a little bit different to where we are today. There are rules of capture. It's called the um, uh, Geneva Convention. Don't know why it's really happening, does it? You know, flying a white flag, you're not supposed to shoot. It's got a red cross, it generally means your first thing, you're not supposed to shoot. But interestingly, Hitler wrote a document, it's actually documents in Stonehouse Barracks, you never get a chance to go in there. And he wrote saying, any commando, any agent, caught beyond the lines will be executed. That's the line. So great, Julie Pikenshi was wonderful. And of course, that's they all got brought to prison over war crimes, that was the idea of it. But uh, yeah, so that's what they got taught. It was, it was tough, it wasn't easy. And on top of that, they did their radio operating, that's learned French, most of them could speak it. Um, and some of these women, interestingly, a lot of them were married to pilots and diplomats and, 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 and men of overseas that generally got captured and injured by the Germans anyway. So for them, it was a little bit about, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you. There's a bit of payback. And, uh, I suppose there's nothing worse than a woman's school, is there? As they say. Right, next slide, please. So we talk about some equipment, and this is my really my my passion, really. I, think I just love kitting equipment. I think every soldier just loves it, don't they? 
they love the kit, they love the guns, they love daggers, they love trousers, we just love it, don't we? And, uh, it, it, and for me, I don't know why, maybe because I'll just, I'll just, I just don't know, kit free, I suppose, I don't know. All the kit, I just love it, it's just so tactful, you know, to think, you know, you've got a little secret camera, you know, you've got a button with a compass in, you've got a lipstick in with a compass in case you got caught. Because it's not just about the attacking, but it's about evading. So if you did a job and you killed this person, you know, in a brothel, or you threw a grenade into Jerry Tank as he went past, or you blew the train up, or you um, blew all the ammunition dumps up, or you got that document, and if you got captured, your first thing was you was on the run. You had to escape and evade. You had to escape and evade. Yeah? And keep yourself alive. Yeah? Because particularly men, you would be absolutely got like, sore thumbs stuck in there, wouldn't you? Yeah? If you could speak French, you'd be right, but not many, not many bit men could speak French. But obviously they did. That's why you would go with different groups. And, and the resistance network was phenomenal when you look at it, and it's very complex how it all works, and there's hundreds of films in it. The radios, we were talking about Morse code earlier on, didn't we? Yeah, it was in a suitcase. It literally was in a suitcase. You look at a mobile phone, I was that big in it, and you can speak to people in Perth and Australia now, can't you? Oh, you speak to people in the moon, can't you? We've got helicopters flying around on the moon. Look, look at this. This is a suitcase radio. There it is. I've got one of them as well, sorry to say. About £10,000 I'd buy that today if you want to buy it. Um, suitcase radio, it's got crystals in it, it's got batteries in it, and you literally walk down the streets of you know, any big town of Paris, sorry, any big town, Chandra Lise and Paris, you're walking down, you come across it and you say, oh no, there's a roadblock. Oh no, I know there's going to be an air raid today, and they're putting this, oh no, you need to tell someone quickly. You can't run and get to the local phone, you can't send a letter, you can't send a pigeon. You've got to literally go around the back, open your suitcase, you would throw the ear up over something, and you've got to dip, dip, dip. It wasn't talking, it was Morse code. There's a Morse code key, it's just unbelief here, you've got to turn up in the Morse code key. Yeah. And of course, the Jerry's knew this was going on. So they had special buses going around with big aerials trying to home in where you are. And you can sit down and can't you? I'm trying to find your mobile phone. It was the same here, they found it. That's why your life expectancy was only six weeks. Because they would track you. Particularly in the big cities and towns. Yeah. Because that's where the interest and stuff was going. In the rural parts of France, things were going on, but it wasn't that interesting. In the big cities and towns of Paris, is this where the infrastructure was? Yeah. There was two radios. There was a there was, there was a, um, a bigger and smaller one, effectively, as it says there, different weights. Um, they made the, the the smaller radio because it was it was it was so obvious. To try to walk down the street, you're trying to drag this radio down. But really, you've got to walk down like if you're a businessman or a businesswoman going on holiday. Yeah. You've got to be hidden in plain sight. The best way to hide something. In plain sight. Under your nose. How many times you've been? I never knew Joe Bloggs next door murdered three women. I never knew. Hide in plain sight. There's another radio, and it's not on this slide. I think it might be on one of my last slides. I'm not too sure now. It was actually called the Biscuit Tin Radio. And the reason why it was called a Biscuit Tin Radio is for two reasons. First of all, it landed in a tin that looked like a biscuit tin. All the resistance people stuck it in their biscuit tins in their kitchen. Because when you search the house, you don't search someone's biscuit tin, do you? You search under the floorboards, in the loft, under the beds, search people, put in the bowels of hay. No, I don't search a biscuit tin. Not to my knowledge, anyway. I'm not a policeman, so I don't know, but I've searched properties before. I don't search a biscuit. And that's what's called a biscuit tin, mate. <coughs> but um, as you can see, 500 miles, pretty much get back to Blythe, can't we? But yeah, basic suitcase radio. Very nice. Next, next slide, please. Now, we mentioned this earlier on. That's the biscuit team over the top there, actually. We're talking about Charles Fraser Smith was the Q gadget wizard of World War II. Well, that word Q starts coming into mind. What do we know about Q? Who is Q? Come on, help me out. We've got time to talk about it, haven't we? Who's Q? Well done. Do you agree there? That's him. That's it. That's where Q come from. Because he actually officially worked for Naval Intelligence, MI9, under E.R. Fleming. That's where it come from. Did Q stand for anything? Yeah. What do you think? Have a guess. <laughs> Who? That's Naval. It's a military term. Quartermaster. 
There's a queue called QM. In, in fact, today, I have a QM. My quartermaster is a major, he's a quartermaster. So he's a queue for quartermaster. That's what he says, well, yeah, you're a quartermaster. Stalls. That's what he does. Makes cash, it's called cool. QM. Good man to know, actually. Or woman, there's some good QMs out there, actually. Every, oh, everyone loves a QM because he's the one that can write your kit off or give you a kit. Yeah, Q. And that's what he was a wizard. And, and he wasn't just a wizard, he wasn't actually a soldier. They give him a rank of major in the end. He was, he was just an engineer. He was just a, a bog standard engineer. He was too old to join the war, but he had the brains to win the war. And that's what he did. And they produced a whole range of stuff. Um, this is an interesting one here. Um, it's a stud, it's a collar stud, you wear it in your tie. For example, if you was going to a fancy dance, you was with your female agent, I was a criminal working with you, but both SOE agents, we managed to get ourselves a dance in the best, I don't know, best theatre in Paris, because we were allowed to go, all the actresses were going to invite us, we'd go in, our job was to go in there, gather information, try and get some of the actors and actors on our sides, maybe they could converse some people, don't forget we don't stop working, yeah, get them on there, find out what they do, pickpocket people, find the information, what you've got, I've got his ID card, all this sort of stuff, all of a sudden you get collared, they know you are, it's the comedy act, people are running after you, you jump over the wire, you're in the middle of, where's North and East, I mean our people now, people get lost on the M25, what are, you, what are you going to do in the middle of a field in Paris? Where'd you go? You knew you had to go south to uh, Spain or east into Switzerland. Where is North? Where, where, where are you? I'm in the middle of the road. Where, where's east? There's no sun up because it's the middle of the night. So what would you do? You whip your dicky bow off, you take your button off, you rub the top of the button off, and then you go, ah, east. And away you go. Or you go, got a better idea. Or else might be cigar, you take your box of matches out, you break the box of matches, and there's a compass you would put on a bit of string, east, away I go. All these gadgets were there. Getting about the murky world. So these gadgets weren't just for SOE agents, the gadgets were designed for MI9, and MI9's fundamental job was to retrieve Allied aircrew men. Get them back. They went down in Paris, in France, in Poland, anywhere, even in Africa. We have to get these pilots back, all these trained navigators, because we can't keep up the training. You can't just wake up in the morning and fly a Spitfire or a Lancaster bomber. You can't do it. You have to be trained. We need to get them back. So MI9 said, right, well, we need to get this stuff inside the prisons. So they posted them. Good idea. Could you just post something like this here? Well, of course you could. The Germans searched everything, didn't they? But what you did, you intercepted your Red Cross parcels. Of course you did. MI9 intercepted them. It's all written, it's all facts. They intercepted them in the Museum of London. Downstairs in the bank basements. Anyone know where it was? Anyone know what museum would you think you intercept parcels? Change it. Right next to the Albert Hall. Natural History Museum. Museum. On the ground floor, go down there. There's a more roll on the wall there. And he sets them there. They cut the parcel down. Took the bacon roll out. They bought a box of matches. Or a game. That when you got to the prison camp, converted into something you needed. A compass. Marks. Clothing. Radios. Don't a bacon roll. You need something to escape and evade. That's what they did. This was all under this murky world we live in. You know, Geneva Convention says you can take charity parcels, doesn't it? British Red Cross are doing it today, aren't they? See what they, Royal Red Cross is, taking people in there. Okay. It's a murky, dirty world. Deception, corruption, sabotage, lying, all their words all fall in this subject. They even had silk women's underwear that were designed for maps of Europe. So you walk along, you get searched, what you? Strip down, madam, you've got your lovely white bra, your lovely white panties, get to the prison, off they come, turn this all that maps. 
it just it's the mind boggles what goes on honestly the stuff if you get five minutes couple of hours at Hermes Hotel it's not all of it's there some of it's there but yeah I could go on about this all day long and you can hear my passion of it it's not lots of kit and equipment and I'm very conscious of time I'm sorry next slide please try try keep me going there even the BBC was involved okay. who is the best transmitter of in the world today, British Broadcasting Company. So, SOE, MR9, Public Broadcast Company say, at 10 o'clock at night, will you please send, the dogs are out tonight playing the football. Right, you're on your radio in Paris going, the dogs are out playing, good, the Lysander's coming to get us. Everyone in the field. Or, you're in a prisoner war camp, dogs are out playing football. Everyone go to the back wall, there's gonna be an air raid, we can get out of the fence. That's how they sent their messages, both ways. BBC were allowed to, it's not in Duke and Urgen. Of course they did, particularly D-Day, particularly D-Day. It was the most secret thing, D-Day. People didn't realize how secret it was. But don't forget, it only took them five years to plan it. it took them two days to, to, to execute it, didn't it? And that was a secret, pretty much. It really was a secret. So even the messages were coming pretty much from the BBC. And the lines of communications was vast. Literally vast. It was literally BBC, suitcase radio. Pigeon, I kid you not. I've got a pigeon special harness. I don't know how I'm doing that, but I've got a, it fits on a, on a foot of a pigeon. It's a little capsule, and it was, if it was red, it was secret. You couldn't open it. If it was see through, you could open it. If it was silver, it was just bog standard. So wherever you was, if you was coming out of your house in Poplar, or Silvertown, or Dover, or Hastings, and you found a pigeon, you'd be oh, you had to take that back to the ministry. And that was the messages. And of course there was letters, coded letters. A lot of French resistance women had a coded scarf. There's a very famous one in Hermes Hotel. You wear a scarf, wouldn't you? Men, men would wear a cravat generally, women would wear a scarf, like your scarf. Turn it inside out, and there'd be a message. It'll be certain letters down, certain letters down. It's, it's, it's now Bletchley Park territory now. It's beyond my comprehension. That's how you would do it. Because what you didn't want to do is leave the message that you would already know because you were double at it, because you also had double agents. So it was a very, very tough job. It really was. The communications was the key to success. Communicate in the right manner. And accurate. Okay. Next slide, please. We've mentioned the Lysanders. Squadron 161. These were RF pilots. The women didn't fly these, they flew them around the country, but they didn't fly them into battle. You literally, what this plane originally was brought into service for the First World War, it was originally designed to do spotting for artillery fire. It was actually effectively um, canvas. It wasn't particularly fast, but what it did, it flew really low. They put an extra petrol tank on the bottom, that's what that is, and it could fly into Paris, it could it fly into France, Drop agents off, they'd be on the ground, turn round, anything between 15 and 20 minutes. It was that risk critical. Yeah? And these pilots done thousands of these flights. You know, they literally went, get in the back, three or four agents all sit there uh, squeezed in. Off they went. BBC, the dogs in the woods tonight. We know the dogs in the woods tonight, my sand is coming in, I'll pass four. French would put a T out, the resistance would put a T out, or your agents. Well, Santa would line in, out, 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 in, 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 and away you went. Very, very brave people. The Lysander. I haven't got one there, sorry. Next slide. Right, well, there are roles. We're armed combat, initially known acting as couriers and wireless operators. I've mentioned that to you. We're administration staff in Britain. This was their biggest job, working alongside the French resistance. And there's a classic picture. Yeah. Don't forget, I'm a farmer in France. I don't know how to explode things. I don't know how to shoot a gun. I don't know what good writing means. I don't know how to do it. I need to be trained. I need to be shown how to do explosives. You know, we don't just wake up and do explosives. Yeah. Equipment drops, you can't just drop stuff beyond the lines. Where's it go? What's it in? Where's it gonna go? Where's it land? Where's the best place for it? What do you need? It's not gonna send you a load of fuses with explosives. It's not gonna send you a load of explosives with fuses. It's 
So this whole logistical chain got to be sorted. And it says they're often short the, the leadership role. Because they did. I think women are generally really good at organising for stuff, aren't they? Well, my wife is, my daughter is anyway, that's what I did so. Organising things. Men are all over the place, and we are men all over the place. I don't know what but it's generally what it is. And of course, supervising their training. So that was a commando trainer, supervising their training. Right, next one. I'm talking too much, I'm going to rush a bit quick, I'm sorry. I'm going to talk about some female agents now, which I think will be really interesting. Violet Sabo. A field operator and a courier. Yeah, so she would bring the information backwards and forwards. She would bring French agents backwards and forwards. She would bring information. It's a courier. All right, we still have them sort of words used today in, in the murky world of uh, espionage and sabotage. Training and parachuting. She should kind of rank as it says there. The way she meant jumped in. She worked a lot in Normandy. Lots of these women were extremely cruelly executed. Obviously, the Normandy, as the late as the war was coming, you know, as D Day was coming, it was being more concentrated on, obviously, because that's where he was going to land eventually. Right, next slide, please. She was uh, an interesting character, actually. We're going to talk about Ravensbrück later on, which is a concentration camp. It was a concentration camp for women only. And when I say brutally executed, I don't mean you know, hung, drawn, or quartered. I'm talking about pulling your nails out, cutting your hair off, yeah? cutting your, your chest off, completely demoralising every way possible as a woman, you know, because that's what they could do. That's what the Gestapo did. You know? They pull all your fingernails out. There you go. That's Tell us who your next agent is. No, no, there you go. Ten goes out, you? Ten goes. And, uh, and the Gestapo were good at it. You know? They, they was. They're brutally, brutal people. Say that, George Cross Poshman. Say that. I think she got executed name for George Cross. Yeah, here you go. Next slide, please. I'll put this slide on to explain to you there's lots of films on this stuff. Some of it's true, some of it's mythical. They haven't got an M days when they did these in the late 40s, early 50s. That new thing you see on TV, this might be true, but we like to do it for dramatisation. It might really upset you. It was what it was. Please, when you watch these uh, uh, films and shows, take out. Just put yourself in the mindset of someone behind the lines. You know, behind the lines thinking, how do I survive this? How do I get information? I'm doing it you know, to honour my husband, to honour my family, to make sure Blight is going to win this war, stop the barrage of bombings going on in London or Manchester or Coventry, and then realise, hey, what would this be like? Yeah? And then realise it wasn't all glamour and lovely lipstick and you know, flicking hair and Michael Douglas kissing you in the dark and all this whole nonsense. Yeah? They were good shots as well, probably. Next, please. Adet. There she goes. I ain't right move for four. She parachuted. 22. 22. Nearly as old as me. 22. Apparently the youngest agent, again, we know now, when the information comes out again in three or four years, it could be someone younger. She survived the war. F section. And obviously we know the stories from these people who tell us. Yeah? I don't think she ever wrote a book. I think she wrote some memoirs, but I don't think she ever wrote a book. Interesting set of uh, parallels, I mean she's parachutist. Next slide please. Now this is a really interesting lady. An Indian presence and princess. F section 1943 June. She was dropped into northern France, which is known as the occupied part. So you're there straight away. Your chips are there straight away. You're not just going into the non-occupied, you're going into the occupied part of France where we know the Germans are. And in Paris. 
So you got betrayed by a double agent, actually. And this was all about money. That's what it was all about. There's a film on Netflix about this, actually. I think it's called Call the Traitor or something. It's about, it's about her particularly, when her mum gets told it. She, she died. Um, there's a bit of mystical story went on, but it's a very good bit about her. She was a very innocent young lady, but she could speak fluent French. Again, horrible word, Posthumous, George Cross, and the French critics, critics. I'm not very good at my French, but it's great, they're not good at French. Critics, it's lovely, man, I've read. There you go, thank you. There you go. 1949, look She was young as well, I think she was a little bit older, but they was all, you know, they were all in their 20s, let's say. That's what the Germans wanted. You've, 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 thank you. Virginia Hall, I reckon she was the best agent there ever was, I reckon. Absolutely unbelievable. This woman had a wooden leg. She walked over the Pyrenees twice to escape the Jerry's. Where do you think she would have, where do you think she hid all her gadgets? You're going to stop someone to search their wooden leg in the 40s? No, not, not in a million years. She survived the war and she become uh, too icy the CIA. They never make her full on head of the CIA because she was a woman. I don't think it was still all that nonsense going on in the 40s and the 50s, of course it was. Um, she, she went back two or three times though. She was a, she was a real tough old cookie. There's no two years about that. And a cover story that says that she was a correspondent. So she was lucky. She went in for the American Embassy. And then, and then went out. But you'd never believe she had a wooden leg. I mean, she just walked normal. But she had a wooden leg because she shot herself. Because she'd come from good blood in America. That's where it came from. She'd come from a very posh family in America. Let's go shooting and she shot herself in the leg. Oh, it says it in a hunting accident there. Limping lady. She never had a limp, but she had a limp. Okay, next one, please. This is just a this is just a handful of agents, by the way. For there's 41 of them. I'm not going to go through them all because we, I'd love to. We'll be here for months Sundays. The White Mouse. What a great name. Yeah. I'm going to tell you a quick story. The one before we just come back. Can you just come back on that last slide? I'm going to quick, just going to give you a story here. It's just come very quick to me. One of her escape ta tactics, Riggs, uh, my, my wife just reminded me earlier on was. She got caught in the woods before she was on, 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 on the run, basically. And she was tied up with this other agent. And they said, right, we are going to get shot here. The Gestapo said, that's it, your agents, we know where they are. She got hold of the leg, stabbed her in the leg, it definitely is. We know you are. Line them up, line them up, line them up. As line them up, the resistance made a commotion over the other side, an explosion. So there she was, made yourself. She's mortally been beat up. She's been on the run for three or four days. Her hands are tied. She's like that, starving around, all over the place. No morals. He kicked around, in and out of lorries. She was there on her knees, just about to execute her. How do you get out of that one? How do you get out of that one? In the woods. She had no idea. She thought, how do you get out of that? She said, the agent grabbed my necklace. And she had a necklace of pearls and fake diamonds. The other agent grabbed it, pulled it, of course, to Jerry to start shoot well, diamonds. Both for the diamonds, they both run up and run away. <laughs> That's a true story, it's in her book. Over that. Put yourself in that position. Woods, freezing, in and out of lorries, beat up, effectively mobbly even tortured, semi-tortured. Hands tied me back, just about to get executed. Think yourself that quick. <laughs> what do I have for dinner tonight? Yeah, literally, it's in her book. She pulled this necklace off, the diamonds of pearls were and of course the Jerry's. You know, they're having a hard time, this all thought, diamonds! And away they went, stuck and run. <laughs> How about that? Right, next one, sorry. Right, I promise I'm going to hurry up. Sorry, sorry. White Mouse. They reckon she escaped so many times. That's why they call her the White Mouse, yeah. And as far as she, she became a career for French resistance, finally took her, uh, I'll let you read this.
7,000 troops, how about that? She led 7,000 troops. She organised them. She put them in places. And when I say organised them, she trained them. Not just her, obviously a team. She was the leader. Do this, you've got to get assistance, you've got to get people in. And you're not in line, and I'm not lying. It's the murky will. And you get your kit and equipment. You might have 5,000 people. Where's my gun? Oh yeah, good point. White mouse. There you go, next one. She didn't parachute, she was smuggled by a boat, obviously, it says there, worked French tradition. Captured, tortured, imprisonment in Rensburg camp, concentrating camp. She was left complete darkness for three months. There you go. So I suppose it, it, it's even mind games, isn't it? He wasn't in Elsewhere, he just left in dark for three months. She survived the war, got, got the George Cross. Notice the regiment. Got the fangs. We'll talk about it in a second. Next one. There you go, concentration camp. I don't like talking about it too much, they quite upset me actually. But uh, 1939, located 56 miles, 132,000 women. Went for that camp, I reckon. Eight percent political prisoners, amongst thousands of security around there. Four members of the SOE. There you go. No, it's quite stark in figures, isn't it? Okay, next one, please. There you go. So when you wanted to join the SOE, you couldn't be effectively be a soldier. You weren't allowed to. It, was, it wasn't the British Constitution. Irregular war, they called it. Women in war, how dare they? So you had to join the Fannies. Or the Fanny. First aid nursing yeomanry. Some bought the auxiliary. Uh, Atkinson bought joined the auxiliary air force, but generally you joined the Fanny. The Fannies are head of the Fannies. Any other idea? Anyone who's just head of the Fannies? Princess Anne. Okay, she she's the colonel in chief of the Fannies. It was basically formed in World War One by very very rich women who went, I can't go to war, I'm going. They got the buses, they got ambulances, and drove to Ypres. To become nurses, hence the reason nursing. They couldn't pick up arms, they would ensure their men, their people, their soldiers would be kept, looked after, and kept, and that's what they did. And of course, it went from World War I, being nurses, to World War II, being saboteurs. How about that for a story? There you go, Princess Anne. You're still there today, you can join the Fannies, but not. Their uniform is exactly the same today. Exact same today. In fact, when I open my collection, uh, they're, they're, uh, the small group would come, come to it as well, so it's very nice. Okay, next one, please. All these, all these, um, next, next one, please. All these, all these places you can visit, you can, you know, drop a, I always have a whiskey at some of these places just to get your mind into it. It's not by Lambeth Palace, it's just over Lambeth Bridge. You want people to pass it hundred times and never seen it. Survivor. 209 is quite late, really, when it was unveiled, yeah. There's the figures there 470 agents. Yeah, we'll go with the figures. They change very, change quite a lot. And there's different plaques on different sides. It's a great, it's a great memorial, actually. It's a very, very good location. It's obviously MI5. Interesting enough. Okay, next one, please. Go. Really nice sculptures, this actually. Nice spring out, if you know. They have Golden Square. Very late, 212 again. There you go. So, there's just some of the little memorial places, particularly for female agents. There's not that many for men agents actually, but there's lots of plaques, you know, from where like headquarters was and stuff like Baker Street and stuff like that. Next please. So, that's pretty much where we are. I don't want to bore you anymore. I've been going on for a while and I can see people thinking, oh, where we go, what time we've got to get home tonight. Then the Baker Street Irregulars was also known as Churchill's Secret Army or the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. 
Thank you for taking your patience. Uh, I don't think there's it. I think there might be a couple of us slides which I'm happy to roll on if, if you want me to. Um, but is there any questions? I just wondered how well, you know, the ones that had to take leadership roles when they landed in France, how easy that was. Given we won the war, didn't we? <laughs> well, true, we did. Yeah. But, you know. I guess it was tough. I guess it was really tough. Yeah. You're landing in France, you're asking all these different people, from farmers to doctors to priests, come with me, I'm going to try to shoot a gun. Who are you? What? Mm -hmm. yeah, you needed, and, that, and, that, and them words are tough. It's leadership. And, it's, and it, this ain't murky world stuff now, this is leadership. You follow me. Right, you, want to, you, you want this world to survive? You need to follow me. Take it from me, we're going to, and this is how you're going to do it. See me? I'm a commando. A lot of it is, Credibility, my book. In the world I come from, the military, you've got credibility, people will follow. People will follow. If you've got credibility, they're going to follow. If you come in with no credibility, go, why am I following? What am I following you for that I can't do myself? Bam, land the France, you've got your commando dagger, you've got your machine gun on your back, you've got your face camouflage. Follow me, or you ain't going to survive. Make your mind up, what do you want to do? I know what I do. <laughs> I'm following you. Leadership, that's how you lead. Lead by example. Lead with credibility. Lead with passion. You've got the buy-in. It's business, isn't it? You've got to have that buy-in. It's tough. It's tough. We all, I'm sure we all do it in different business worlds and, you know, we all do in our own life. I've done it in the military, I've done it in the fire service. It's tough. Lead by example. Lead by inspiration. Lead by credibility. And that's how you do it. I've already got half a dozen slides. You can go if you want to go, or I can quickly run through the kit and equipment, which may be interesting. It may not be. Is that alright, sir? Well, it's not up to me. Do you want to quickly run through a couple of little slides? Yeah. You're up for really yeah. fast. I'm, I'm sorry, because I do talk a lot. Keep going. No, no, no. Keep the other one. Further or back? Keep going, keep going. No, you can go back. Yes. You go back. Hi, how are you? Yeah. Start. Right. That's me. I'm off to the palace next week. Get a nice little medal for my experience in the military, by the way. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll have a word with the Queen for you. <laughs> yeah, so that's where we're going to go. Next slide. Remember, London Clandestine Warfare Collection. I've also got some pins here. If you'd like a pin, please take one. Um, they're free if you want them, but if you want to make a donation, please put a donation in the bag. It's not for me, it's for the collection going forward. I hope you didn't mind me doing that, by the way, sir. Mm -hmm. You're there. Wire cutters. You need wire cutters, you need cutters to fuse um, uh, deck wire, box standard wire cutters. This is what you get. Original. Let's go. Keep going, young lady. Keep pressing. Fuse, fuse wall. These. These will be kept. Underneath a floorboard, so you lift the floorboard, you put them underneath it, you'd have the deck called running outside of it with explosive. I don't know. It's a dirty, dirty, murky world we live in. Under the door, perfect. Nice bar, nice pub, nice restaurant where you know they're going. You're reconnaissance to these people, you're thinking where this Jerry's going. The Gestapo, I know that Gestapo is hunting me. I need to execute him. So it's a game of big cat and mats. I know he goes to that pub every Tuesday. I know it's going to do it next Tuesday. All right, next one, please. Pop on the top looks like lipstick, doesn't it? It's a pink lipstick colour. That would be on the top. It's a pink lipstick. That would be in your handbag when you got searched. Wait, Jerry, search. What's this? Oh, it's a lighter. Underneath that lighter is a compass. Pull that to pieces. It's a compass. So if you then got on the run, you throw your light away, you get your compass out. I know where I've got to get back to Blighty. Yeah, next one. It's all this compass you can get, look. So you'll have your pen in your pocket. Don't forget to be writing messages, you'll be sending stuff. And don't forget we had people in banks. You had resistance people in banks upsetting. There's a famous SOE, it's called the Banker. He was, he was taking marks and francs and losing the money and giving it to resistance. You had to, you had to move money around. You needed money to eat, to feed, to buy, to bribe. You bribe someone. 90 grand, tell us the information. How much are you worth? 90 grand, 100 million? That's what it was. Yeah. If you got caught, 
Top of your pen off, blight, Nick Clark. Camera, post-war one, this one. I'm in the process of buying a war one, but they're extremely expensive. But it's a little James Bond one you've always seen, yeah? Originally made in Russia. <laughs> okay, next one. Cards. Now, these weren't playing cards, but you had to put these cards to places, particularly in France, because when these planes come over, the resistance would be trying to shoot them down. They might be shooting their own planes down. So you had to have a card to recognise what planes they was. You didn't know what they was. Yeah. Next one, that's a Lysander, obviously. It's called a prostitute dagger. Don't forget Paris. Huge amounts of prostitution in Paris. Huge amounts of prostitution in London. Huge amounts of prostitution in the big cities. It's fact. It's true. It happens. It's the oldest trade there ever is. Of course, women, you know, in the 1700s, needed protection. So if you didn't pay your dues after what you, ever happened, you got a nice little tap on the shoulder. Here's your money, yours, I'll stab you. It's funny, I think, it looks like a cargo dagger. Well, of course, when the, when the Germans invaded, all that stuff had to be given up. Well, of course, everyone don't think so, I'm the one. And that effectively was originally a prostitute dagger, then converted to a re resistance dagger. Because that's what you did. Okay. Is that right? Makes Bill prostitute. I hope so. Ne next one, please. Pen. Assassination. There you go. That would have been a gentleman's pen. A woman's pen would have been much more remote. Than that. So a man would have had that in his pocket. He's following a Jerry into a bank. He's following someone into him, or he's in a car. You get searched before you go in. So if you go into the theatre, you know you could be. Uh, I don't know. A concierge in a theatre showing people where the seats are. You'd be searched because you knew the Jerry's were coming. Well, of course, it's, it's only a pen, sir. It's right there. On his autograph. Take the bottom off. You've got a dagger. An assassination tool. Got someone in the neck, in the heart. These are true life gadgets from Q. Next one. Obviously, every roll of We know that's a particularly SOE one because what you see in the old cowboy film, do. They'd cut the end off because you used to catch in your trousers. So you cut the you would cut the stock off where your thumb was because you used to catch in your trousers, so you cut it off. Then you just would press the trigger. Next one. Right, that's enough for me. Uh, I think I'm about an hour and forty in, so I apologise. But that's what my aim is, to preserve the past for the future. That is my badge, that is my collection. Who can tell me the code in that badge? In that who can tell me the code in the badge? I don't know what that means. <laughs> you spoiled the shrink now, didn't you? But well done. <laughs> the man who um, thought that idea was a good friend of mine, I thought it was quite a good idea as well. So. Where is it? I don't see that. This is the SOE. Oh, there you go. O S S S O E. I only know SOS, so I worked out. Oh, it's not SOS. S O E. Freezer. S O S S. There you go. And that's for the collection. London Pandora's No Warfare collection. Don't be shy. Go and lock it. You're more than welcome. Um, they don't charge that much in the hotel for a, a gin and tonic. And if you seriously want a little walk around there, I'm sure you know, people don't mind getting through it. I'll, I'm happy to come and meet you and show you where Shaker Not Stirs was or take you to the, the Stafford Hotel and show you where uh, the American pilots would go and meet all people. And uh, where Ian Fleming used to uh, visit the, the, the Dukes all the time. But you know, a cocktail there is about 98 quid, I think. But uh, anyway, I hope that's uh, enough information for you and it starts your flavour of interest. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm, I think there's some more water and stuff if you want it. Um, if there's any other final questions, I will... Just, just to ask. <laughs> Uh, the SOE stuff um, or anything to do with it in the um, Imperial War Museum? Or in yes, very little, very little. Um, and in fact, I would be very privileged. Um, so, one of my very good friends is the archivist of GCHQ, and he's in contact with all these all because he is official historian. Are you talking about Tony? Tony? Yeah. No, Dave Abertat. Oh, yeah. Okay. Do you know Dave? Yes. Good man. How do you know? I used to work at Bletchley Park. Okay. Oh, you know Dave. Um, tell him I've done a good job with that. <laughs> He's the one who gives me all the, all the stuff. Yeah, Dave's really, really good. Um, 
So, so he does all that stuff. And they're trying to get some money for Bletcher Park, one of the museum on the side of Bletcher Park as well. They? Yeah, Dave's trying to raise some money for it. Um, so Dave actually contacted me and said, look, Dave, they're doing this thing called Secret Behind the Museum. You might see it on TV. They want to do my stuff as well behind the scene if I can. That'd be great for my collection as well. Uh, but yeah, but I mean, this, you know, you know post-war, this stuff would just throw. No one's interested. I mean, my granddad come back from D-Day. My granddad didn't get his medals almost to the 90s. I think it was 1998 or something he got on. And I got there when I was in the military. He just wasn't interested. I said to him, Fred, why didn't you even Dave? He called me son, actually. He said, son, I want to get onto Elsie. I was interested. I ain't seen Elsie, which is my name, for five years. I left here and D-Day. I'll be back for five years. I'm not, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't, would you? It's only people as late as time this stuff becomes interesting. But all the, I mean, interesting, some of these knives I pick up are at the most obscure places. They'll be at like some farm boot fair and you think, that's an SOE boot knife. And of course, it was used for a farmer to cut his grain for many years after. And of course, they still wanted metal. You still had to take paperback. Well, of course, it all just went, most of it. So some of it's still around. A lot of it's still in France, but the Americans buy this stuff up like it's going out of fashion. And that's my biggest uh, challenge to beat the Americans, but they've got big money. So. Anyway, I hope that answers some of your questions. Um, like I said, please uh, 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 send my regards to them. They did such a bad job. Uh, and if you want to, if you, if you want to go and look at it, look at St. Ermin's, or, or if you want to wander around just I'm, I'm sure you can go through the gallery and I can catch up with you there is a website I'm working on the website I'm truly working on the website but I'm on my own it's just me and Alex um, and I've got a full time job and all this stuff's really hard to do with and a full time job and a family and all the rest of it I'm sure you're bored with all that sort of stuff but I'm working on it but it's, it is going to be hopefully um, well I'll we'll get it eventually is it finished but that's it I won't talk anymore I'll shut up and you can uh, tell your friend finish your ways. Thank you.